Hello everyone, you're tuned into today's PIR live event and I'm your host Scott Jones. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome our live stream viewers. Remember that you can tweet your questions anytime using the hashtag AskPIR during the live event and I will relay them to our guests during the question and answer period. If there's room in your tweet, please include your name, school, or city and we'll give you a shout out. I look forward to getting to some of those questions, but first I'd like to introduce our guest, Dr. Maria De Rosa. Dr. DeRosa is an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry at Carleton University. Um, I'll, I look forward to getting to some of your questions, but first I'll turn it over to Dr. DeRosa, who's going to tell us a bit about her research. Go ahead. Great. Thanks so much. Um, I'm excited to be here. So I'm, I'm here at Carleton University in the Chemistry Department, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about chemistry in general and then I'm going to talk about the work that I do in my research lab. So as a chemist, um, I get to do a lot of fun things uh, during my day. And one of the main things that we do as chemists is we make observations about changes that could happen in chemical reaction or in the environment or almost anywhere. So I'm going to show you um, a couple of demonstrations first that are a good example of how chemistry can help us basically understand changes that are happening with molecules, in this case that are in solution. I have two different solutions for you. And then I'm going to talk later about how this sort of thing relates to the research that we're doing every day in my research lab. So what I've got here, I've got two different solutions. Um, they both contain water and they contain a, a type of dye it's called an indicator. So you can see probably on your screens that these are colored solutions. I don't know how well the color shows up. This is a, a very dark purple right now. I don't know how well that, that shows up. And that's a, a pretty pink, a bright pink. And what's interesting about these molecules is they can help chemists, or anyone really, understand a little bit about what's happening inside the solution at the molecular level. So if we could actually go down and see the molecules that are in this water, what's going on? These indicators change color depending on something called the pH or how acidic the water is. So you probably have heard of this term before, acid. For example, in our stomachs, we have a very strong acid that helps our digestion process. In these solutions, these solutions are not acids right now. They're actually neutral. And the color of these dye molecules, these indicators, is telling me, the chemist, as I'm observing, that we're looking at neutral solutions of water. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change these solutions to become more and more acidic. The way I'm going to do that is a bit different than what you might have imagined in a, in a chemistry lab. I'm going to use uh, a, something that's called dry ice. So I'm going to bring it a little closer to the screen. It's cold, very cold, almost minus 90 degrees Celsius. It's basically frozen carbon dioxide. Okay, So the same sort of carbon dioxide that you're going to breathe out every day, this is a frozen form of that. What's interesting about it is that carbon dioxide, when put into water, can make something that's neutral into something acidic. So this is something that we see every day in our carbonated beverages. So when you drink a Coke or when you, when you drink something that has carbonation, uh, the bubbles are coming from the carbon dioxide, but the solution ends up becoming a little bit acidic. So now you may be hearing some bubbling going on, and I want you to take a look at the colors of the solutions as this bubbling is going on. So what's happening right now is carbon dioxide from the dry ice is dissolving into the water, and it's changing it from a neutral solution to a more acidic solution. And this, you may have noticed, is no longer a pink solution. I'll bring it a little closer to the camera. It's gone clear. That's what happens to the indicator as the solution becomes more acidic. And this solution that was starting off as a, as a kind of a purple color is slowly changing. We'll see right now it's a greenish color. We'll see as it changes a bit more and more over time. What's inside this uh, water, this solution, is called universal indicator. It changes many colors as it goes more and more and more acidic. So why this is interesting is because people are talking a lot about carbon dioxide and how carbon dioxide levels may be increasing in the atmosphere. They also would be leading to higher carbon dioxide levels in things like lakes. So we may be able to use chemistry and our understanding of chemistry to understand what's going to happen in things like lakes as carbon dioxide, more and more carbon dioxide is also there. So we can take a, another look at this Erlenmeyer that's, or this graduated cylinder that's full, full now of our, of our bubbling carbon dioxide and water solutions. 
And now if you take a look at it, it's gotten kind of green and slowly, slowly, as I can see it on my side, slowly it's going to show up on your side, I think. Uh, it's turning more and more yellow. So you let that sit for another minute, maybe add a little bit more carbon dioxide to it. So this is, you know, this dry ice is no different chemically from the carbon dioxide that you breathe in. So I'm going to show that in my next demo that we can have the same effect by blowing into a solution that contains the indicator. So now I'll bring this a little bit closer. I think now you're starting to see that it's getting more and more yellow. Definitely not the same color we started it with. So this is telling us, you know, this color change is a way for chemists to observe that there is a change in the pH, the acidity of this solution. I'm going to help it along a little bit by adding hydrochloric acid. So this in this beaker, it's a clear liquid is hydrochloric acid, dilute hydrochloric acid, not very strong, which is similar to what we would find in our stomachs. So it's a dilute version of the acid we would find in our stomach. And if I add that now to really change the pH of the solution, to really make it acidic, you start to see a more orangey color show up with the indicator. So I think by now you can definitely see a difference, even on your screens, from what we started out with. This was a bright pink when we started and now it's clear. And this was a dark purple and now it's almost orange. Hopefully you guys can see that well. So what happened here is basically a chemical demonstration to show that we can use chemistry to better understand changes that are happening in a solution or in, in water or in a lake. I used carbon dioxide that was frozen to do this experiment. But as I mentioned, this dry ice that I was using, right, so there's the dry ice again, very cold, is no different in its chemistry from the carbon dioxide that I breathe out every day that you and I breathe out. So now I have a different solution. It's basically a dilute version of that original solution. So you can see a, a kind of purple color to it. It has the indicator in it. And I'm going to blow in it. So as I blow into it, carbon dioxide is going to dissolve from the, my breath into the water, and it's going to take a solution that's mostly neutral. That's why it's this purple color. That's what the indicator is telling me. I'm going to change it slowly but surely to a more acidic solution. So it sometimes takes a little while. I am full of hot air, but maybe sometimes not enough. So we'll take a few moments to blow into the solution, and you'll see what happens. So I'll try to do it so we can see everything happening. So hopefully on your screens, you can see now that the purple has changed to green. It actually, before my eyes, I already blew enough in that it turned to a kind of yellow. I won't be able to get it too much more orange than that. That's probably about as bright as it's going to get. So that just happened because of the carbon dioxide that was in my lungs as I was breathing it out. I could change this solution from neutral, right, which is not acidic, to an acid, basically. So the same chemistry applies whether you're using your breath or you're using dry ice like I was using earlier. So that's the first demonstration that I wanted to show you. And that's going to relate to something I'm going to talk about later, the ability to sense changes in the environment. right? So I'm interested in showing you this demo for fun, but also because it relates to the research that we do, which is finding new ways to sense chemicals or other changes in the environment. So we'll, we'll come back to that idea in a minute. The next thing I'm going to show you is something that uh, is also important to chemistry. Chemists like to make new molecules. Okay, They like to make new material. That's another job of a chemist. Not just to observe and detect changes, but also to affect changes, to cause changes by making new materials. So what I'm going to show you, again, this is a kind of a fun demonstration. It's called elephant's toothpaste. And then I'm going to show you something really that we're making in the lab, something a new material that we're making in the lab. So just give me one second, I'm going to grab the elephant's toothpaste, and I'll explain what that is. So this one, I'm going to get it into our view here. So hopefully you'll be able to see it. Yep. Okay, great. So the, the, the shtick with this is that we say, well, chemists love to make new things and we love to solve problems, right? We like to make new molecules and help us solve problems. So imagine a zookeeper trying to brush the tusks of an elephant. It's a big job. You need a very good soapy toothpaste in order to be able to do that. 
So imagine that in the lab, we've made a brand new type of toothpaste, right? A really special type of toothpaste specifically for elephants. And you can see it in here. This is a, a formulation we've been working on for a while. And I'm going to add a little color because I like aqua fresh toothpaste. Aqua fresh toothpaste is the kind that has the stripes. So I'm going to put a stripe of blue on one side of this graduated cylinder. This holding my special concoction of elephant's toothpaste. And I'm going to add a stripe of red on the other side. And then we're going to add our secret ingredient, and we're going to see what happens to our elephant's toothpaste. So, let me get just right here so we can see it. And I'm probably going to step out of the way a little bit. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> So our elephant's toothpaste has exploded, and all the soapy loveliness will be ready for brushing elephant's tusks at any moment. So the truth is that this is not really toothpaste for an elephant, right? What I've done is shown you another chemical reaction that has kind of an explosive character to it. What's happened is I've mixed two reagents and made oxygen gas, basically. I've mixed something called potassium iodide at the bottom of this uh, graduated cylinder with some soap. And then I added hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide is something that you may have in a dilute form in your medicine cabinet at home to treat, you know, small cuts and that sort of thing. So we mix those two things together inside this graduated cylinder. What happens is another gas gets formed, just like I was showing you carbon dioxide a minute ago, oxygen gas gets made, fills up the soap with bubbles, and then you see the big you know, explosion of bubbles that comes in. So elephant's toothpaste is, you know, a pretend new material that chemists have made. But in truth, many chemists around the world, in Canada and elsewhere, our job is to make new materials to help solve real problems. So brushing elephant's teeth probably is not a real problem, but we are solving real problems in the lab. So I'm just going to move this out of the way so that I can see you a little more closely. And then with my last few minutes of intro, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that we actually do in my research lab. Doing two of those things that I've basically introduced using my demos. The first thing that we're doing is trying to detect new molecules or changes in the environment. And the way that we're doing that or trying to solve that problem of detecting molecules and changes in the environment is by making new materials. So mixing the two demos together. So for the next couple minutes, I'm going to describe my research, which is about a type of synthetic DNA. So I think many of you probably have heard the term DNA before, or you may have seen something that looks like this twisted ladder molecule. These are actually two strands of deoxyribonucleic acid. And DNA is a biomolecule that basically is the building block of our cells, holds our genetic information. It's a very important molecule in biology. But as a chemist, I make synthetic, non-natural DNA in the lab, and we use it for detecting other molecules. So the type of synthetic DNA that we work with is called an aptamer. And what aptamers do is they recognize and stick to other molecules. And that's going to be our building block that we're going to use to detect changes in the environment and to solve other problems. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of examples of what we're doing with this special kind of DNA called aptamers. One of the things we're doing is we're making something that basically looks like a mini uh, a test kit. This looks like a mini pregnancy test, and it contains DNA aptamers and gold nanoparticles. That's what the red color is coming from, something called gold nanoparticles, tiny, tiny, tiny particles of gold. And what these sensors are, these little tests that we are making, what they do is they use an aptamer to detect a toxin that could be present in food and crops. So we're interested in using our technology, our aptamer technology, to make very inexpensive, easy to use tests that almost anybody could use at home. A farmer could use it out in the field as they're growing crops. Someone could use it um, at, a, at a food processing plant and they'd be able to tell if there were these toxins present. They'd be able to detect, just like we saw we were able to detect carbon dioxide in the water. 
be able to detect these molecules in the environment. So this is something that we use uh, our aptamers for. Another thing that we use our aptamers for is to make materials that we call smart materials. And these are ones that recognize changes in the environment and respond to changes in the environment. Uh, the one that thing that I'm going to show you is a little animation in a minute about making a smart fertilizer. So fertilizer is a way to deliver nutrients to crops as they grow. We want to make fertilizers that deliver nutrients very efficiently, only when the plant needs that nutrient and not when it doesn't. And that way the fertilizer doesn't get wasted, doesn't get washed into the environment to cause environmental problems. So I'm going to share with you a little animation. Let me just take one second. So I'm going to just wait a moment to make sure that everybody will be able to see this. Yep. That's great. That's People are going to be able to see this. And what I'm showing you here is a, a kind of an animation of a, of a system of roots. And what we do is we work with a great scientist at Agriculture Canada, Carlos Monreal, who realized that there are signals, and they're represented by these blue spheres that are coming out of the roots. There are signals that are coming out of roots like wheat and corn, and these are signals to the environment saying, I need nutrients now. I need fertilizer now, basically. So what we've been doing is developing aptamers, this synthetic DNA, that recognize these signals, these blue spheres. And we've been putting them into coatings to coat fertilizers. So I'm going to show you what that looks like now. So imagine over here these orange balls are fertilizer. We want to protect it with a coating that basically doesn't let too much of the fertilizer out. But when the plant sends the signal to say, I need nutrients now, this is going to repeat so you can see it a bit more closely, when that signal is received by that coating, the coating breaks down or becomes more porous and the nutrient is released. So let's look at that again. We have aptamers inside a coating, the signal is received and all of a sudden now the nutrient is released. The idea is that hopefully by packaging up fertilizer in this way, I'm gonna stop sharing so you can see me now again. By packaging up the fertilizer in this way, we could protect the fertilizer so it's not lost to the environment and to cause environmental problems, uh, but it still retains all the useful properties, which is to feed the actual crop and help it grow and help us feed the world, right? So this is the work that we're doing, and many other chemists and uh, scientists around the world are doing similar things, but the basic story that I wanted to tell you today is that we can detect changes in the environment and we can make new materials and it's chemistry that helps us to do that. So I'm happy to take your questions. Great, thanks Maria, that was uh, super interesting. Um, as Maria said, we can uh, take your questions at any time uh, using the hashtag AskPIR on Twitter. Um, in the meantime, you, you talked about um, um, DNA uh, and so you make that in the lab. Um, yes. How do you go about designing them or how, does the, how do you actually make DNA? It's very interesting. So we can be proud because this is a Canadian invention. It's something called a DNA synthesizer. And uh, basically it was scientists in, in Canada that were first able to put this. It was, it's an instrument. It's a machine together. And it builds DNA one building block at a time, one base at a time. So I'm just going to put up my picture again of what we imagine my biological DNA looks like. So it basically is two ribbons here, right? There's one ribbon. And there's the other ribbon, and they're interacting with each other and binding to each other through these kind of pendants on the chain. They're called bases. And basically, on this instrument, on this machine, we can build one of these ribbons, one base at a time. And we build it on a bead. So we basically have a small, tiny, micro sized bead. And on that bead, we build one step at a time the molecule of DNA. It's fascinating. It's a triumph of Canadian science that we're even able to do this. Uh, and now these machines are all over the world. People are building DNA this way. And the DNA we make, so this is something that people are usually interested in. It's, it's synthetic DNA. It's very, very small and short. So in terms of uh, building you know, a genome or something using a synthesizer, we wouldn't really be able to do that because we only build about 100 bases at a time, say, on the machine. And you know, a genome could be billions of base pairs, right? So it's not able to give us, you know, to help us make new organisms or anything like that. It's synthetic. And we use the DNA as a material, not as a biological component. Cool, cool. Um, so what's the main reason for, for fertilizers then? Is, is it that there's not enough nutrients in the current soil? Or, or is it just Very that... Good question. Yeah. Yes. 
So every time we plant and have something grow out of the soil, right? All the building blocks of the plant, all the proteins and the DNA that are in the plant, the, those elements that make up that plant have to come from somewhere. And they come from the soil. So the soil starts off and it may be very rich in all kinds of nutrients come from, you know, other dead organic matter, for example. We plant something and then the nutrients get taken up into a plant to make the plant materials. Then we harvest that plant and we've taken those nutrients with them, right? So what's left behind is a soil that has less nutrients. So there's lots of ways to replenish those nutrients, among them, you know, using organic agriculture, using manure, all sorts of things. But one way that's used worldwide and at large scales in order to be able to feed large populations is to use chemical fertilizers. And the problem with chemical fertilizers is that not that the nutrient itself is bad, it's nitrogen or phosphorus, these are building blocks of life, that that's important and natural. What's, what's not good about them is if they get wasted, if they don't end up in the plant, but they end up in a lake or they end up in a river, that's when fertilizers cause problems. So if we can take those nutrients and make them more efficient so that they only end up in the plant and they don't end up anywhere they don't belong, then we could cut out a lot of the problems with fertilizers and only retain what's good about fertilizers, which is the ability to feed them. Cool, cool. So uh, this is, I guess, more for, for large-scale farming uses then, right? There, there'd be no applications to, say, home gardens at all, you know? Well, you know, who, everyone asks that uh, uh, right away. They say, can we use it on my tomatoes or right. something in my garden, right? <laughs> I think maybe one day, okay. because even on the small scale, people want to be sustainable, people want to be efficient. At home, a lot of people want to use, for example, organic gardening because they don't want to add, you know, unnecessarily fertilizers to the ground. This might be a way that we could do more sustainable agriculture, even at home, right? So I think um, not right away, we're not at that stage yet, but eventually this could be something that everyone could use. Okay. Uh, so, so what stage um, is this research in? Like, how long do you think it'll be before uh, these types of biosensors are in widespread use? Great question. So um, in terms of things like these, you know, our small test kits, this could be something that could be moved along relatively quickly because it doesn't require um, that kind of in-depth environmental testing, right? This is something that would be from the research lab to the commercial use pretty quickly. So we're thinking in a couple of years, we might be able to get these out. The smart fertilizer, though, is going to take a bit more time because we're, we're right now working at, you know, at the greenhouse type level. Uh, but we need to make sure that what we're doing doesn't add environmental problems, right? We're making these coatings. They're made of biodegradable, biocompatible material, but we need to make sure there's no residues left behind. So there's lots of study we have to do because that's something we're going to put out into the environment. So that's probably more like on the 10 years time scale, whereas the, the small kits that are, uh, you know, have less environmental potential environmental impact. That's something that could be out in the next few years. Okay. Uh, so we got a question here from, um, looks like Sir Ernest McMillan, uh, secondary school in Toronto. Great. Um, and they want to know, um, so that the aptamers sense toxins, as you discussed. Yes. Um, can the same method be used to get rid of these toxins? Really interesting idea. So there is some interest in detoxifying things, right? So using aptamers as kind of like a sponge, right? You pass your whatever material, you the water or whatever the whatever it is that you're testing through this sponge, and the aptamer grabs up all the bad stuff, and you let the rest go through. So definitely, there's an interest in doing that. We have to see if it can be done in an economical way, right? Because it has to be done so that it's inexpensive. One thing that we're really going for with these types of kits is that it's something that anybody could use. You don't have to be in a in a in a, a science lab. With with lots of funding or something like that to be able to use these. We want them to be cheap enough that anybody could use it. Or in the developing world where some of the toxins we're interested in are a big issue, we want people there to be able to use these things with at low cost. So if we could do it in a low cost way, definitely I think there would be interest in using aptamers to detoxify, right? Grab up all the toxins. It's a great idea. Okay. Um, another question coming in here, and it's, it's something that I was looking to get to myself. Uh, this comes from uh, St. Elizabeth Seton School in Burlington, Ontario. Um, can you use this technology? Um, that is, does it have any applications to, to medicine and, and cancer treatments? Excellent idea. So when we started, we were very interested in using this, uh, the smart materials as a way to protect chemotherapies basically, for, for example, right? So that they only are released to the unhealthy cell and not released to the healthy cell because this is where side effects mostly come from for drugs and cancer therapy and that sort of thing. 
So we're definitely very interested in, in pursuing that as well. And we're working on aptamers that recognize biomarkers of, of, say, for example, cancer. So these signals that relate to cancer as opposed to signals that are coming from a plant, right? So different types of molecules, but same technology. An aptamer would recognize the signal that's coming from an unhealthy cell and then release the contents of that capsule only to those cells and not to the healthy cells, hopefully limiting side effects. Okay. So it's a great idea. Yeah, we're cool. trying it. Cool, cool. Yeah. Um, another one here from on Twitter, uh, at Milm Math Tech is the Twitter handle. Um, can, can fertilizer use using synthetic DNA help reduce water used for agriculture in California to maybe offset the drought problems that they're having there? That's really interesting. Um, I have to think about it. So the, the definitely, you know, if we can produce, I could see an indirect effect, right? So if we can produce less fertilizer because this fertilizer is more efficient, uh, fertilizer production takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of water. Right? So then I definitely see a, a water conservation aspect in that way. The plants, perhaps, if they're well fed, um, would need different water, the amounts of water. So that's a possibility too. We haven't looked into it, but it's something very interesting that we should definitely investigate. We've been looking at it from the point of view that if we have more efficient fertilizer, then less water will be getting contaminated, right? So we'll have better fresh water uh, available, but not so much does it mean that less water will be needed for the crop. So that's a very interesting question we have to investigate. Right. Okay. Okay. How about a bit more um, about your research group in, in particular? Is it, sure. is it all chemists that are, are working for you or do you have Great other... Question. So we have a range of scientists who are in my research lab. I definitely have chemists. I have biologists, biochemists as well. There have been times when I've had people who have done physics or people who have done computer science because we have other types of uh, questions that we're asking about these aptamers that require, for example, more physics uh, background or require modeling on computers, for example. So definitely the research is what we would call interdisciplinary. There are lots of different branches of science that can feed into this type of research. We also have obviously collaborators who are, for example, soil scientists, agronomists, these sorts of things. Um, we, we're working with physicians who are interested in the medical application. So it's a big team um, with all sorts of different backgrounds, and that's really what we need. Chemists can provide a certain, you know, certain set of, of answers, but we need a big team of all sorts of different experts in order to be able to really solve problems. So hopefully, as a team, we can do that. Okay. Um, follow-up question to that, it, it's something that I, I like to ask all of our guests, and, and that is, if a student listening today is interested in, in bio, nanobiotechnology, uh, yes. what advice would you have for them to try and get into that field? Well, it's a great question. And, you know, what's really interesting, people will ask me sometimes, how did you get into this field? Really, I don't think this field even existed when I was in high school. So, so it's something to keep in mind that that science is changing so rapidly, nanotechnology is one area that's changing so rapidly that where you may end up may not even exist yet, right? So it's not necessarily about studying one specific thing, right? So while you're in school, you know, stay with your math, stay with your sciences, and, and keep your training, you know, keep, keep a breadth to your training, right? Because what my experience is, is it's by having a, a good base of understanding in kind of fundamentals of science that, and math that can allow you to explore new branches of science as they emerge, right? So it's like, oh, maybe impossible to predict, you know, exactly, you know, if I just study this one thing that I'm going to be the best bio nanotechnologist because if the field is changing so much, what you need is that base. So keep your, keep your sciences, uh, keep your maths, keep on top of that, get that good solid base, and then as these new areas emerge, then you have the training to ask the right questions and the training in how to answer those questions, right, which is basic, you know, science. That will, will allow you to thrive in any sort of new field. Okay. Okay, uh, that, that's great advice. Um, unfortunately, it looks like we're about out of time for today. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to our guest today, Dr. Maria De Rosa from Carleton University. Um, and before I let you go, I'll, I'll just give a quick plug to the next PIR Live event, which is uh, tomorrow evening when we'll discuss teen science research and publishing your results all before you leave high school. Uh, you can find the full schedule of upcoming events at www.pirweb.org. So thank you again, Dr. DeRosa, for taking the time to answer our questions today. My pleasure. All right. Thank you. Bye for now, everyone. Bye.